In the previous video, we discussed grid search. And to be specific, uh, we discussed a caching mechanism to make sure that grid search doesn't needlessly waste compute resources. This is a very useful technique, but there are also other ways of doing hyperparameter search. In particular, you can also go for a random search. Random search is a very powerful technique too, and there are reasons why you might prefer it over grid search. And that is something that I would like to expand in this video. However, as we'll see, while there are many merits of random search, there is a small caveat uh, that we are going to have to discuss as well. Before diving into that though, uh, what I would like to start with is just explain the idea behind random search and also give a quick demo of it. The best way to explain the difference between uh, grid search and random search is to use this image from an influential paper. Uh, the show notes will have the link. The thinking is as follows. If you are running hyperparameter search on a grid, then it is possible that you might have one important parameter and that you might have an unimportant one. And you're going to specify a grid up front that is going to be somewhat regularly spaced, perhaps. And if you were to search through the space by just trying out all these different settings, well, then there is a chance that the optimal value actually lies between two grid points, which is kind of shown over here. And in such a situation, you might end up picking some combination of hyperparameters that is the best out of all the possible values in the grid, but there is a risk that you're going to be missing out on the peak that actually lies somewhere in the middle. The thinking is that if instead you were going to go for a random search where basically you're not going to construct a grid, but you're just going to say, well, there's a minimum value and a maximum value for each parameter, and I'm just going to sample uh, randomly in that space, well, the odds of you hitting this particular region with good performance from a important parameter, well, that's actually a lot higher. The grid is constraining you less, and the odds of you bumping into a hill could be a bit bigger. And to perhaps make that just slightly more intuitive, let's think about how much compute resources we actually spend exploring a unimported parameter in this case. Because of the grid, we are really just checking three values on this important parameter space because we are also exploring this one. I'm spending nine points, but in practice, only three points will actually matter while exploring. If I were to compare that to what's happening over here, though, the story is a bit different. Yes, I'm definitely still exploring the unimportant parameter, but because each point is random, I am spending all nine points also exploring the important space over here. And this is also part of the theoretical argument here. No matter how you go about constructing your grid layout, because you're exploring more than one axis, you are at risk of only partially exploring a region that matters. And that's not the case in this uh, random setting over here. This is a solid theoretical argument, but there's also another, what I think, uh, practical benefit of using random search. But to show you that, it helps to actually dive into the code and actually uh, run this. So I'll do that next. All right. Um, so I'm back in Jupyter Lab over here, and I've set up a grid search over here. To run this grid search, I will be using a data set from Scikit-Learn. It's the load breast cancer data set. Uh, the idea behind this data set is that we have some information about patients, and we are going to predict whether or not they need a medical diagnosis. But the goal of this grid search is to apply this model onto that data set and to test a few hyperparameters. In particular, I'm going to go over the maximum number of iterations as well as the um, L2 regularization parameter. One thing that's a little bit interesting to always keep in mind here is that uh, some of these parameters, like uh, in this case, the max iter one, uh, that requires a proper integer value. You cannot have floating point numbers go in here. Um, so to construct numbers that might be interesting, I am saying, well, let's still use the NP lint space function. I want to have a minimum value of 10, a maximum value of 200. Uh, and I'm really interested in getting evenly spaced values between them. These are technically seen uh, floating point numbers, uh, so that won't fly. So I'm casting that back to an integer, uh, and that gives me values that are appropriate for the grid uh, over here. And note that I uh, don't have to do that for the L2 regularization over here. Uh, that's just a value that can uh, start at zero and go all the way up to uh, four in this particular case. 
Now I'm keeping the grid uh, small here. I could go for more parameters. But in this particular case already, I'm testing 10 values over here and I'm testing 10 values over here. So together, so together I already have a grid with 100 parameters that I would go check. So let's contrast this now with how I might do this if I were to do a random search instead. I'm using the randomized search CV object in scikit-learn. Again, I'm passing the same model, but notice a few differences. Here I'm dealing with a parameter grid and here I'm dealing with a distribution of parameters. I can still construct this distribution in a very similar way, but the interpretation is just a bit different. The list that I'm going to be passing here represents a distribution that I'm going to be sampling from. And that has a interesting consequence. If I'm just gonna zoom in on the max iter parameter, because I'm going to sample points between 10 and 200 here, uh, I can definitely increase the resolution. This random search is set up in such a way that I'm going to be sampling 100 examples from this distribution over here. And because I'm sampling, uh, I don't have to worry about a grid that's going to explode, and I can actually have some settings here that are quite granular. And notice that the same thing is happening over here. Before, I would only really check for 10 values, but now nothing is really stopping me from going for 50 values. Now, one thing to also observe here is that there are also other ways to construct uh, distributions here. You can actually use proper SciPy distribution objects. Definitely check the documentation of this object if that sounds interesting. But for now, at least, I do hope that you agree that, hey, I can come up with very granular lists over here to sample from. And I guess a really pragmatic benefit of doing it this way is that not only can I be somewhat granular, I also get a fairly nice tuning knob over here. One interpretation here is that this number of iterations can be seen as the amount of patience that I have as a practitioner. If I have time, because I'm going to lunch, let's say, then I can really put a high number in here and it will just really keep on sampling, keep on sampling as it's exploring this distribution. But if I don't have as much time, I can put a lower number in here um, and then the search will just be done quicker. Something about that to me also feels extremely pragmatic. Again, because I don't have to worry so much about a grid that's going to explode over here. Having said that, let's now uh, run both and uh, compare some of the results. Okay, so they both just ran. Um, I have 100 combinations of parameters here, and I've also got 100 over here, so it makes sense that the time taken is roughly equal. But let's now check out some of the results. And what I'll do is I'll just make a very similar chart to uh, what I started with. Both charts have an x-axis that depicts the L2 regularization parameter, a y-axis that depicts the maximum number of iterations, and the color of each dot indicates the performance of my cross-validation. So the very bright color one over here, as you can confirm with this color bar, uh, that tells me that the model on average had a score of uh, 97%. Uh, whereas these dark blue colors down below here, uh, they tell me that it was more around uh, 94. So it's about 3% difference. That's what we're talking here. Another clear difference is uh, over here, we can see there's definitely a grid, while over here, uh, we've definitely been sampling. And again, in terms of a vibe check, one thing to me that's just uh, standing out is that there are a couple of low performing scores uh, at the bottom over here, which is just confirming to me that having a low maximum number of iterations, and with my understanding of the model, that also makes sense. As mentioned before, I am spending about 30 points down below here, while only really exploring three values of the maximum number of iterations. Now, on the random side, you could argue that in the same space, I also have roughly 30 points, but at least over here, I am exploring roughly 30 values for the maximum number of iterations. It's not necessarily based on a very static grid. I really have lots of different values over here because I am sampling. And also in terms of a vibe check, uh, the grid search over here technically is telling me similar information than uh, what this random CV is telling me. There's definitely this one region over here in this part of the search space where uh, I should probably spend more time searching. But now imagine that we are going to repeat this exercise, but we're gonna have not just these two axes of parameters, 
let's say now we're going to have four. Well then, I do hope as a vibe check, you do feel that this random search over here does have its merits. Because if I just think about the number of values that are actually being explored over here, then over here there's something perhaps more granular happening than over here. And because you're always afraid of exploding the grid over here, the odds of not being granular enough is something to keep in mind. So there's definitely a lot to like over on this side. There are really good reasons to consider this random search. That said though, there is a caveat that we do have to talk about when you're considering going down this route. And to appreciate this caveat, uh, let's go back to the pipeline that we had from the previous video. In this pipeline, we were dealing with a text use case, uh, but we were also dealing with some hyperparameters uh, one for this uh, truncated SVD and one for this logistic regression. However, when we constructed the pipeline, we also attached this memory object at the end. And this object is going to help us cache. That means that when we start running our grid search, we're not going to recompute uh, all these different truncated SVDs uh, for data sets that are going in. We are going to cache that. So for every single a value of the hyperparameter that I have in the grid over here, I'm going to be storing a trained component on disk, so that doesn't have to be recomputed. And that was great because this component over here was fairly compute intensive. And we can also see that when I run this grid search with full parallelism on and making use of the cache, that it takes me about 20 seconds in this case. But now let's compare this to the random grid search. Now, for complete fairness, I am definitely making a pipeline over here as well, one that does have a cache that's attached. And also here, I'm using the same number of iterations as above. But one thing that is going to bite us now is the fact that if we want this to be more granular, by making use of that patience tuning knob that I alluded to earlier, then odds are that I'll have lots of different values over here. And for each hyperparameter value that I have below here, I am going to need to store a separate model like this on disk. And in this particular case, if the number of iterations is equal to 20 and there are 20 options to pick from, then I will definitely not be able to hit my cache as often as above over here in my grid where I only have a few values listed. And this is something that's reflected when I actually start training this. Because I'm less able to make use of the caching, uh, training this system takes about 40 seconds, and this is a system where there probably are a couple of cache hits. If I were to make this uh, even more granular, uh, then this might start taking me even more time. So even though there is a lot to like with this grid search over here, there is this one caveat you got to keep in mind that's related to the cache. When you are dealing with components in the middle that take a bunch of compute time, then caching is a mechanism to speed things up, but that will only work if you're somewhat conservative with the number of choices that are available. Now, one thing you could still do is you could say, well, let's just have a smaller grid for the number of components. And this could be seen as a balance because you are still going to be sampling, but you are definitely going to hit the cache a few times this way while still using proper random search on the axis over here. So that should certainly be better. Let's just confirm that. And there we go. This is down to 15 seconds now, which is a huge improvement, but it does eat away at the granularity over here. So it's not necessarily a free lunch and you might still need to think about the way you do grid search well here. If you wanna have caching, well, then you need a smaller grid, which means being less granular. It can still make sense to use some caching uh, in your random search over here though. Just be aware that if you're going to be very granular here, there could be reasons for it, but you may incur a uh, computational penalty.